All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. Uh, name of our talk is Sustainably Awesome, How to Build a Team. Uh, so when I started at HashRocket, uh, I came from a place of great pain. It was government work doing .NET, and uh, I just got to the point where I realized that spending 40 hours a week, which is more time than I spend awake with my wife, and uh, I don't like the people that I'm working with so much anymore. Um, so I sought out a different opportunity. Uh, John Larkowski had just moved to HashRocket and uh, found out that they had an opening and went over there with him. Hi. Hello. <laughs> Hi, I'm Les Hill. I was introduced to Ruby and Rails in the fall of 2007. My friend and fellow rocketeer Wes Gibbs had been using Rails for a while and he convinced me to go to the inaugural RubyJax meeting. Uh, that was my introduction to the unique and vibrant community that's grown up around Ruby. Um, we also met the people who would go on to start HashRocket in early 2008, Obi, Desi, Lark, and Tiger. Uh, they exemplified the spirit of Ruby and Rails, getting it done fast, getting it done right, having fun while you're doing so. This started my adventures with Ruby and Rails by March of 2008. I'd built three web apps, I'd com <laughs> contributed a little bit to Haml, and uh, Obi, uh, at that Ruby Jacks meeting announced uh, that HashRocket were hiring. One week later, I was the seventh Rocketeer. So when we started uh, HashRocket, uh, we had the, uh, the idea that we could uh, build some awesome products and uh, get rich doing it. I think most of us have that, that dream. Um, but after a few launches that were successful and a few payrolls, uh, we realized that we had to pay the bills. And therefore, we've said, let's do some consulting to get by. And uh, ultimately, product efforts got shelved during that time. Uh, became apparent that with consulting, we could do 40 hours a week. We could do a sustainable pace and uh, have the, um, the boat trips on Friday idea. So basically, we took the easy way out. Oh, let's see if this works. Does this work? Yes, great. Uh, we learned some lessons about building a successful software culture al along the way. We're here to share some of the lessons that we've learned uh, so that you too can build a sustainably awesome team. So hiring the right people is critical to building your awesome team. Openness and transparency are essential to keeping the trust and focus for your organization to keep your awesome team going. That's how many awesomes in a row? <laughs> a lot of awesomes. All right, so participation in giving back to the community, give your team perspective and an opportunity to grow. Uh, agility. It takes practice and discipline. I think we heard about that from Glenn this morning. Uh, but when done well, makes for an awesome development team. And a comfortable, productive environment is crucial to nurturing an awesome team. So let's start with some of the things that we don't do. Developers have authority and responsibility to get work done. It's on their shoulders. We don't penny pinch. Uh, we have a budget and we stick to it. Uh, data point we have about uh, we have a weekly grocery bill, runs about $400. But uh, the well-stocked kitchen, I think, keeps us uh, from leaving the office and uh, keeps us uh, energized. Sustainable pace is not just a phrase we parrot. So we have no meetings at HashRocket. Well, uh, except the daily stand-up, the daily project stand-up, and monthly mission control. And the HashRocket way and Book club. Book club. So we have meetings. <laughs> but realistically, your day-to-day -day, uh, working environment is one that you're not stuck in meetings all day long. You have a daily stand-up with everybody that typically lasts five to ten minutes. You have your daily stand-up with your client, which can last anywhere from five minutes to you know, 15 or whatever, depending on what they want to talk about. We remain as flat as possible to this day. I think we're about 40 people now, and we're still basically as flat as we were on day one. So no future proofing? Future proofing? Well, if you fireproof, you keep the fire out. If you weatherproof, you keep the weather out. So if you future proof, you keep the future out. We love the future. We're excited about the future. But, you know, kind of taking a lesson from software development, you are not going to need it. So we don't future proof. So this is a picture that we took recently. and. 
it is not the entire team. In fact, there's some visitors in there as well. We have people from Sweden. Wow, that's really hard to see. People from Sweden, people from Germany. Um, we have you know, a lack of people from up in the Chicago office and the Chile office. But as we started preparing the talk, it was a really uh, a good picture of you know, the team at the moment. And uh, we'll talk more about this picture as we go along. So this is a picture of Hash Rocket. It's a picture of our culture. This picture is, in fact, a cultural artifact. Cultural artifact? <laughs> a cultural artifact is how we know about cultures, both past and present. But they are not themselves the culture. Who remembers Rails maturity model? See, like the entire hash rocket table and nobody else. Okay, <laughs> sweet. <laughs> so the idea behind RMM was that it was designed to capture best practices. And that best, uh, desi uh, designed to capture practices in the Rails community, and the best practices would emerge. Um, RMM is dead. No, it's not. Doesn't think it is. It's mostly dead. If you go to the RMM site, you will find it, thanks to Heroku. Let's take a quick digression on cargo cults. I think everyone's familiar with the term cargo cult programming. That is, programming with little to no understanding how the code you're working with works. Uh, this term is most well known because of the John Frum cult. This is a religion that arose in the 1930s in the South Pacific nation of Vanuatu, paradise basically. Uh, the movement was heavily influenced by existing religious practice. This was the worship of Ka Rap Ramun, a god associated with Mount Tukosmara. During the Second World War, some 300,000 American troops arrived on the islands of Vanuatu, and they brought with them large and just endless amounts of supplies or cargo. After the war, the followers of this John Frum cult, which predated the Americans arriving, in an attempt to attract further deliveries of good, would engage in ritualistic practices, such as building crude imitation landing strips, the aircraft you see here, radio equipment, and then they would sit there and mimic the actions that they had seen the military personnel take in an attempt to get the cargo to come back. So looking back on RMM, uh, what it turned out to be was a collection of cultural artifacts. Uh, it was designed to capture practices, and that's what it did. It didn't capture the context of uh, why or how these were making us successful or making other people successful. Um, they were easy to parrot, but they lacked the, the rationale and context to make people adopting them successful. So given the time constraints, we're going to cover uh, empowering developers, trusting your team, and what's important uh, about methodology and how to hire. Uh, so w early on, uh, John Markowski and I were actually working on a, a bash script. And, um, we were cleaning up some old files or whatever, some images that were uh, temporary images. And what wound up happening is we accidentally forgot to CD up the directory. And uh, so we ran the script, and it ran for about two, two and a half minutes. And then we're like, uh, <laughs> Can you guys hear that? <laughs> Probably not. <laughs> Anyway, uh, yeah, basically we had started at root and started removing everything. And because we didn't you know, have any need to you know, confirm the temporary images that we were deleting, we had RF. And uh, so what would your organization do when they're faced with this? <laughs> the institute of policy where the developers don't have access, pseudo access to your uh, boxes? Would they say just don't do that? <laughs> Or would they, uh, why is that not going? I think you've got a range problem. Yeah. Out of range. Uh, develop a backup solution. Basically, would they know that this is going to happen in the future? Protect you from yourselves to some degree and just make it easier to get back uh, up and running. And basically, the, the moral of the story is don't handcuff your developers. Um, there's an awesome quote by Clay Shirky. Which says process an embedded reaction to prior stupidity. And that job that I was talking about earlier, the government job, that's nine to five. That was an embedded process because people before me were stupid. And I was stupid. So trusting your team. Here's another story. One of our clients came to us 
after having spent about six months in two development firms uh, to get what was basically a very detailed requirements document, tons and tons of high fidelity mock-ups, lots of diagrams, you know, event diagrams, all sorts of UML diagrams, uh, and some software that didn't work. Uh, sorry. And on top of this, uh, the good news is that there was this spectacular looming deadline. They had about six weeks that they needed to do a demo. They were meeting with Facebook to show them this awesome app that they've been working on for the past six or seven months. Uh, and it would literally make or break the company. Company. So in desperation, they came to us and said, you know, what can we do? So how did we do this? How did we help our client? Well, we called everybody together and said, everyone, listen up. This is an emergency. We're not going to pair, and we're not going to write tests. Of course we didn't. That's not what we do. Uh, forced heroics are going to destroy the trust and confidence of your team, and they're actually going to lead to poorer results. We know this. So instead, we listen to the client. We help them craft a minimum viable product. This minimum viable product was not in their mock-ups. Six months, and they were building the wrong thing. We worked at a sustainable pace. This picture, although it looks like it, it's at night, is from that effort, and we are working in a room with low light, but it is actually the middle of the day. Uh, we did iterative design and development. We did outside-in testing. We delivered working software. We kept to our process, the process that we know works, has worked for us in the past, continues to work for us today. We met the deadline. That company is now one of nine global Facebook partners for their ads API, which is kind of a private API that only certain people are allowed access to. And the lesson here is stick to what you know is right, even when you're facing significant pressure, whether it's money or deadlines or what have you. In addition to reinforcing the trust and confidence that you need to have an awesome team, it lets the team focus on what they need to be doing, which is delivering software. So another story, in the early days of Hash Rocket, it was pretty obvious that everything was uh, sort of up in the, up in the air. Um, we didn't have, other than some, some basic, you know, we wrote story cards. Uh, everything was sort of exploratory and we were able to, you know, try different things and make sure that uh, we were getting the best solution that we, that worked for us. Early on our story cards were written on three by five cards. I'm sure a lot of you have done this. Basically, when a story was picked up to be worked, we'd go to the board, we'd pick it up off the board, we'd move it to the other swim lane, and then we'd be working on the board. This worked very well for us. Of course, until there's one person that's no longer in the office. Uh, in this case, you can see, barely, that uh, Desi is remoted in from Chile. Uh, so the idea that somebody is working uh, on those same cards, but doesn't have access to that wall, it was a new requirement for us. Uh, so. With these new requirements, we had to evaluate the situation and adjust. Uh, so in early 2008, uh, we started using Pivotal Tracker. Uh, who used Pivotal Tracker? Cool. Um, and that, so we started using Pivotal Tracker, and Pivotal Tracker is awesome. So therefore, that's the end of our story. Of course not. Uh, once we became comfortable with Tracker, we started evolving our uh, story formatting process. We started just addressing everything. Uh, and we began to understand Tracker differently. <coughs> so when we, had, uh, when we started, we had this blank slate. Everything was sort of up in the air, and uh, we had some experience to draw from it, to, pick the, to evaluate things and pick the best things that worked for us. So what's changed since then? Nothing. <coughs> we still challenge what we're doing on a daily basis. We do what works. We try new things. We, uh, we try new things. If they work, we keep them. If they don't, we throw them out. <coughs> Save me less. <laughs> hiring. Uh, so talk about hiring. Uh, hiring decisions need to be made with hard, measurable criteria. If you're hiring someone because you like them, you're doing it wrong. <sighs> Passion and excellence, excellence do not come cheaply. They take hard work and diligence. Someone who's phoning it in, someone who's coming in and, and not really doing the work, um, it takes that awesome and passionate team, turns the dynamic around. The slackers thinking they're lucky stars that they have a job, and the people who actually make the environment what it is are looking to make their next jump. 
So everyone should know who this guy is. This is Joel Spolsky of Fog Creek Software. He also writes the Joel on Software blog. And one of his most popular posts is entitled The Gorilla Guide to Interviewing. If you are hiring people and you have not read it, you should do so. His advice is to look for people who are smart and get things done. These people are passionate. They love to communicate. They love to explain what they're doing, both to other members of the team and to anyone who will listen. They often take leadership roles in what they're doing. They have a history of getting things done. They ship software. They solve problems. They contribute to OSS. We think everyone should hire people who are smart and get things done. But there's one more thing. Uh, they need to be a great cultural fit. Uh, there are many creative, innovative, passionate people out there, uh, but not all of them will fit with your culture. Uh, we've actually, I mean, we've had this at Hash Rocket where we brought in people and they just weren't a fit. You know, it's not, they were uh, not good, just... Uh, Didn't gel. Yeah, exactly. So you spend 40 hours a week, like I said earlier. Uh, make sure that you have uh, similar values. Make sure that you get along and it'll make uh, work a lot more enjoyable. So we put a lot of thought into how we hire and uh, we spend a lot of time with the candidate before we make our decision. And that gives us confidence to make sure that we're making the right decision. Um, sure. Uh, to start, we distribute the potential candidate's uh, work to multiple reviewers. For those candidates that we are interested in, we continue up with the phone screen and dive in deeper on a couple of points that we might have found there. And if there's still interest on both sides, then we're going to ask the candidate to come in for a week-long interview on-site with us, pairing and participating in the culture of Hash Rocket. So examining the work a candidate has produced is obviously more effective than reading a resume. I think this is self-explanatory, but I'm going to tell you some of the things that we're looking for. So for our candidates, we're looking for a mastery of Ruby and APIs. We're looking for their testing. Are they writing good tests? Are they writing bad tests? Why are they writing bad tests? Maybe we can kind of see what their thinking is in the code. Uh, we look for common idioms. We look for known anti patterns, right? Self everywhere is one that I love. Uh, clean and simple code that is easy to read. Well factored code. In fact, we like to look at code and kind of walk it back through the commits. GitHub's great for this. We love GitHub. We look at the commit hygiene. We look at the tools and libraries being used. Can you describe Git hygiene? Uh, the commit hygiene. So when you do a commit, what are your messages? Are they, oh my god, I don't know what this is doing, or are they actually clear, concise, documenting commit messages, right? And that's what we want out of the software that we write. So when we look at other people's software, that's what we're looking for. So we also take a look at their online presence, Twitter, GitHub, blog, whatever, for a sense of what they think is important, cool, and interesting in software. At this point, what we need is a passing grade, uh, and at least one person to be excited about bringing the person in. <clears throat> Once they get past that review, uh, one or two of us will do that phone screening, and there's not a whole lot of structure to that. We just get on the phone and uh, make sure that they have an idea of what's going on. Um, wow, that's impossible to see. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> just we just want to... Uh, we want to, what we want to do is get some open discussion and, and honest reactions uh, to what we found interesting when reviewing that person's work. Uh, we're also getting a peek at their communication skills, which for us is terribly important because all of our developers are uh, consultants, so you will be dealing with clients. <clears throat> Finally, we do have the week-long interview. This is a one-week gig. Uh, we provide accommodation, and we expect that you are here to participate. Uh, so there's generally an after-hours component just about every evening, whether it's happy hour or perhaps improv, if that happens to be on while you're there, something like this. Absolutely. And, you know, we, we have happy hour. No, not everyone drinks. Uh, that's <laughs> cool. Whatever. Uh, during the week, the candidate pairs with one to two people every day. Uh, the pair is expected to have something interesting to work on, so we don't want to pair you up with somebody to learn uh, how they work and then have you doing tedious, you know, uh, CSV changes or, or whatever, um, or setting up a slice on engineer or what have you. The, so the candidate is ex expected to do a fair amount of the driving, um, and at this point, we're presuming they're smart, and we're evaluating if they get things done, and if they're a cultural fit. So the things that we're looking for, we're looking for coding ability, we're looking for design sense, we're looking for refactoring skills. We want to see your work style, we want to see the attention to detail. We want to see the openness to different ideas and different way of doing things because chances are 
you're not doing it the way we are. Uh, we also look for uh, adaptability to pairing, to outside in testing, to VIM, if anybody was in the VIM talk earlier, uh, tracker and stories to the environment, you know, where these people are going to be working with the clients, are they going to be able to do that? Uh, and we want to see their problem solving style. Even people who are not pairing with the candidate are expected to seek out the candidate and get to know them a little bit. There are going to be plenty of opportunities during the week to make that happen. Everything from, uh, you know, going out to lunch or the happy hours. Or, or going to dinner. Going to dinner. So how do we decide who to hire? Uh, we ask the team. And we ask the team, are they smart? Do they get things done? And are they a great cultural fit? If someone says hell yeah to all three of these questions, they own that decision. They are excited and invested in making that person succeed. This is going to be especially important at HashRocket and a lot of other software development cultures because we don't write things down. Knowledge is conveyed through conversation, observation, and participation. We learn from each pairing opportunity. Each pairing opportunity, some new technique is now brought into the fold and over time will get spread throughout the entire company. This is how you build your awesome team, one hell yeah at a time. <laughs> so how do you build that awesome team? Well, we just told you. But now we're going to tell you what we just told you. So by hiring people who are smart, get things done, and are a great cultural fit uh, for your culture. By having open communications that are going to foster trust and organizational focus. Uh, participating in the community and giving back uh, get, uh, gets developers energized and uh, motivated, and they feel connected. Being disciplined, deliberately practicing, and continually evaluating your software process. Uh, investing in your equipment. Uh, I don't know if you guys know, but we actually had a couple of robberies uh, this spring. And uh, in the span of two weeks, we lost eight, uh, nine IMAX, something like that. And the, what we did was we went out and we bought new IMAX because it, it's that important to our culture. Right. So does, that, does that mean that you know, if you guys don't have IMAX that you need to run out and buy them? No, but that's one thing that we value. Right. Uh, so creativity and imagination make the culture of your team. Foster these and you will be successful. Any questions? Oh, we use workbeast.com. <laughs> uh, we use, uh, typically we, we actually use, uh, we just put out a, an ad in GitHub when they, when they launch jobs. We put out an ad and uh, we put a posting up on workbeast. Uh, a lot of times we'll just tweet and we'll get uh, people coming in that way. Uh, we've got a number of developers following us and some people might have uh, an itching to move. So. I never really question. Yes, that's it's true. Like what you're talking about about hash rack, there is a lot of interesting things you could say, you know, possibly the institutionalization of stupidity while also saying be flexible with your process, you don't just have a process. There's an orthodoxy in hash rocket. Like there's an orthodoxy in every company. Not to say it's bad. Apparently the one in hash rocket produces a lot of money. <laughs> <laughs> and that's great. Yeah. No, I don't think it's Vim either, and I think that's a great point. And this is actually why we brought up the point about cargo culting. And uh, the issue is that it's not any particular practice. It's not using Vim. It's not using Pivotal Tracker. This isn't what makes you successful. It's the kind of the meta around that, right? So practicing diligently, right? Being disciplined, uh, sharing the values. In other words, if you have a pair where one person thinks that test first is awesome and the best thing ever, and the other person is saying, I hate writing tests. Where's the productivity in that pair? I'm telling you, it's in the toilet, right? So having those same values, even if they are, we all love Vim, those add up and they multiply together to give you that awesomely successful and sustainable team. That's really the message that we're trying to get across. Maybe we need to work on that, because it only came up at the end. But I, I definitely hope that that's the message that you guys are getting, which is don't copy exactly what we do, but kind of take the meta idea of you've got to really think about what you're doing, think about your culture, 
understand the reasons that you're doing these things and kind of be deliberate about it. Do you have something to add? Uh, no, I think you got it. Any other questions? Yep. Have you mapped all the titles to the names of the things behind it? <laughs> Absolutely. In fact, um, it was probably less than two hours ago that we took out the firing slide. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I, I could bring it up if we wanted, but the, basically the point is, even after we go through that interview, if after a time somebody turns out it does, that they don't fit, you know, they're not bad people. They just, you know, for whatever reason, they don't fit, whether it's culture or, you know, what have you. Um, it starts to become apparent to, to everybody involved. And, you know, it's not productive to, it's not productive to leave that uh, situation fester. And uh, so I would recommend firing fast, you know, once you realize that there's a problem. And... Uh, Do you want to talk about the remote office? I mean, we've got some time, so... Uh, one of, we, we shrunk down our talk. We had more stories to tell. One of them that's kind of a, all of the stories that we told were kind of positive stories. We did have a negative story to tell, which is still in, in play. We haven't resolved it, right? Correct. Uh, everybody may know, or certainly I'm going to tell you now, that Hash Rocket has three offices. We have our main office in Jacksonville Beach, Florida. We have an office in Santiago, Chile. We have an office in Chicago. Those two other offices are new offices, and they're staffed by, I think, uh, two people currently in Chile, had been four, uh, and then four people in Chicago. Uh, three, three had been four. Th th three had been four. And in fact, uh, it's, it's creating a little bit of a problem for us at the moment because the way that we share this culture is through that daily interaction, uh, through observation of you know, what other people are doing. And we haven't got a great solution yet to being able to uh, communicate, being able to observe what people are doing in the remote offices and vice versa. Right, we have a real uh, dichotomy between the people who are in Jacksonville Beach and what they think is good and what's important and the people in the remote offices and how they're working. And it may actually only be perceived. In other words, uh, we feel that the folks in Santiago and Chile are producing great work. But at the end of the day, we don't have a, a solution yet that kind of gives us that confidence that the culture from the original hash rocket has transplanted successfully to the remote offices. Yep. So are you defining, I mean the problem you're finding right now with the remote offices, are you trying to define success by the cultures being the same or by the cultures both being independently affected? Uh, that's a great question and I think ultimately uh, you know we've got some people that have, have gone to each uh, office from Jacksonville and the, the culture is going to be different in Chicago uh, because Chicago is different. You know, there's not a big beach culture and whatnot. Um, so it's going to be different. We're not saying are they exactly the same, but do they interact well together? You know, if somebody goes to, from Jacksonville to Chicago, are they able to just go in and work and and be right. you know be successful on a day-to-day -day basis? And you know, can we converse and and uh, get along? Basically? Right. So like one of the things that we haven't mentioned, but that's kind of a bonus at the Jacksonville offices, because we work in open war rooms, oftentimes someone will just kind of kick back from their workstation with their pair and say, hey, I got a question, and just kind of address it to the room. And then the folks who are interested in the question can pipe up and say, oh yeah, you should do X, or no, you should do Y. And maybe in fact a whole <laughs> disagreement and argument may occur, but eventually there's an answer gonna come out. You cannot do that with a re remote office. And then of course, that answer is local, and until that answer kind of percolates out, right, that's going to take some time. This is the kind of stuff that we're, that kind of gives us the grief, you know, where our angst is around these remote offices. Absolutely. Yep. So, so do your remote offices participate in your daily stand-up? Yes, uh, as much as possible. Um, in fact, I recently went to the Chicago office, uh, and it was striking to me how different stand-ups were, how different they felt. Because when you're in Jacksonville, everything sort of live action. And in Chicago, you watch it through your monitor screen. And uh, we actually, we have a microphone that we pass around. Um, and it's, you can hear exactly the person talking. You don't get to cross chat. Um, so they do participate. They absolutely get less out of it. Um, you know, and that's, that's terrible, but uh, it's a, a, a situation that we're trying to solve.
Any other questions? Yep. Yeah, so the, the, the one week working together before you hire someone thing, I mean, I, I like the appeal of that, but like my company does not have the clout to just tell someone to take a week off of their current job to come possibly not work with us. How do you, I mean, how did you guys get to that and, and, and find the other ways of understanding how people work without such a kind of onerous requirement? Sure, and uh, again, this is what we do because it works for us. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so you know, take take the practice. Maybe you can only get people to, to come for a couple of days or whatever. Yeah. Uh, but and maybe they don't come to you at all. You know, do what works for you. But uh, spend that time with the person however you can. Uh, you know, when we started, we were doing three two ones and we had guest stars. So we had people like Thoughtbot, Shopify, um, Hampton came in, and the OG consulting guys came in for a week. And that's really where that came from, is uh, spending the time with those people. We really got to know them, actually boosted our skills a ton. Uh, so any chance that we got to co-work, you know, we got to know them, and we knew whether or not we could work with them you know, on longer projects or whatnot. So who were we, though, as a you know, four-person consultancy to say, hey, take some time off work, come down and, and work with us? There was a financial incentive for sure. We paid them. Um, but that's about all that we offered. Yeah, I think it was because we valued it, right? We felt that that was the right way to hire someone, is to make sure that you are a fit, or as much of a fit as you can possibly be before you actually hire them. You owe it to the, to the person that you're hiring, you owe it to yourself to do that. I think another thing that we do that's kind of in the same vein is we have an open door policy, and this may be something that might be a solution for you guys, which is have an open door policy, let the people who are interested in you come to you, get to know them that way, and then if you have openings, you can say, hey, you know, John, uh, you were here six months ago, we've got an opening, we'd love to have you come back, are you interested, right? I mean, it gives you an, that opportunity to get to know them first, right? Um, and I'm just thinking, you know, just right now, but. Uh, in fact, we have a, an open door policy, if anybody's in the Jacksonville area, <laughs> Chicago area, Santiago, Santiago, Chile, uh, you know, come on by, and uh, as long as there's room, as long as there is room, you're more than welcome to come in and work with us. There'll probably be an NDA you have to sign or whatever. Uh, question? Oh, this is just kind of like a process question about yep. like the skill sets of the people. Do you have separate QA people, or do the developers, you know, kind of mostly do the QA, the business people do the QA? No, it's, it's, we have as flat as possible. Really, the only delineation we have is we have Developers, front-end developers, because that guy doesn't want to be called a designer, and designers. Um, but it's as flat as possible. Yeah, and also our practice is test first. So we are effectively our own QA department. Yep. I'm saying good question. <laughs> All right. Uh, for us, it's been... It, we haven't really had much of a problem with it. Um, you know, people that are taking the initiative to come work with you, typically, you know, they want to spend time with you. You know, if we have developers that are doing open source work, we'll even pair them. Um, you know, we've, I, I, I guess I'm struggling to come up with an answer for you because it, it's not something that we've seen a lot of problems with. Um, yeah, I think it's a matter of setting expectations correctly, right? Which is have the person expecting to come into work, whether they're going to come into work on their own stuff and just be in the environment, or whether they're going to come in and pair with somebody on open source, right? That's something we really didn't touch on, but, you know, HashRocket supports open source and we get time to work on open source. So folks would, uh, you know, there'd be an opportunity for that when someone's coming in. And we can work with them, right? So if you give us a week's notice, and we know you're coming in, then maybe someone can say, hey, you know what, I want to do that new release of my gem. I'll work on it with this guy when he's coming in. Okay. Any other questions? All right. Thank you. Thank you.